Welcome to October's ECR Wednesday webinar, hosted by eLife, a series that aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. Today, our speakers will discuss how early career researchers can attract funding from private sources. The webinar will begin with the panelists sharing their stories. Then, in the second half of the webinar, we'll be putting your questions to them. To ask a question, you can in the question box on the GoToWebinar Functions panel, or you can tweet us, we are at eLife Community, using the ECR Wednesday hashtag. Finally, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording the webinar and we'll make it available on YouTube in the near future. Now I'll pass over to Brianne to introduce the panelists. Thank you, Emma. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Early Career Researcher Wednesday webinar on private funding in science. My name is Brianne Kent, and I'm a postdoc at the University of British Columbia and chair of the eLife Early Career Advisory Group. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Just a word about our host. eLife is an initiative led by scientists for scientists with the mission to publish outstanding research, improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the peer review system, and recognize responsible behaviors in science while trying to expand and enrich the concept of research impact. eLife also makes it a priority to support early career researchers and for the past four years has had an early career advisory group. This webinar series, ECR Wednesdays, is just one of the initiatives that eLife has launched to help support the ECR community. I would now like to welcome our three speakers. We have with us Professor Hervé van der Schren from the University of Liège in Belgium. We have Mary Rose Franco, who's the Executive Director of Health Research Alliance. And we have Candy Hassel, Head of Researcher Affairs at the Wellcome Trust. Thank you all for joining us today. Over the next hour, our speakers will discuss the growing role of private funding in science. With increasing competition for public research funding, more researchers are searching for other sources of funding from philanthropic organizations, crowdsourcing, private companies, nonprofits, and professional groups. Our speakers will provide insight into how to find private funding sources, what private funders are most interested in funding, and key considerations when applying for private versus public sources of funding. Private sources of funding may be of particular interest to early career researchers launching independent research programs who are interested in the smaller grants to fund risky pilot projects that will provide the foundation for larger grant applications. Please follow us on Twitter, at eLifeCommunity, and with the hashtag ECR Wednesday. We will now open the floor to our speakers. Up first is Professor Hervé van der Schoen at the University of Liège in Belgium. Professor van der Schoen has led a research team focusing on crop biotechnology at ETH Zurich in Switzerland since 2007, and was appointed as Professor of Plant Genetics at University of Liège in Belgium in 2014. Over the last 15 years, his research activities have been focused on the study of crop responses to biotic and abiotic stresses, as well as on the implementation of tools to improve crops in developing countries. To perform his research activities, he has received funding from various governmental and non-governmental sources, including private foundations. Professor Hervé? Yes. Good morning or good afternoon. I don't know what I should say, depending where you are sitting in the world. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my, my experience and, and views on, on private funding. Um, as you clearly mentioned, I, I've been leading a research group back in Switzerland for a couple of years and now in, in, in Belgium. Um, and um, yes, of course, through my, my career, I had various opportunities to apply for funding, of course, public funding uh, very often, but also some uh, private uh, foundations. Um, I've made various experience with, with this, this kind of uh, application. It also very much depends on where you are uh, sitting. So I could, for example, say that in Switzerland, there are many more private foundations than, uh, than in Belgium, for example. So this is 
probably easier there to find some opportunities. Um, I have a bit of a special profile because I'm doing crop biotechnology in Europe, which is a very difficult uh, topic. So it means that you have also to be quite strategic in uh, in the way you you present things, the way you try to to attract uh, interest and of course funding into your lab uh, to perform some uh, research. Uh, so one of the key things uh, for me has always been to clearly identify what those private funders are very interested in. So very often those private foundations, uh, except if you talk about very large foundation, if you talk about the Rockefeller or the Bill Gates, of course, they have interest in many different topics and probably any topic you can think of, they might be interested at some point point to to support um, but if you talk about more i mean to talk about smaller um <clears throat> foundation or smaller private funding uh, agencies um, then they are usually a bit more targeted um, and i could cite for example as an example uh, i got funding from the velux foundation the, those this company making uh, windows uh, and at that time it was very difficult for me to see how i can get them to found uh, crop biotechnology uh, while their focus was actually on light and vision, that was exactly what was stipulated on their website. Um, but in the end, we I, I managed to get funding from them by by um, making a link of um, light stress in plants and accumulation of vitamins. Um, and this has allowed me to to perform a very successful study on on uh, biofortification in in Gaza, which was one of the crop I was focusing on, African crop, and and to manage to to actually use some of this of this funding from the private foundation to see how we can use or manipulate pathways of vitamin biosynthesis uh, in order to increase. Uh, of course, vitamin content and also to look at other potential resistance to stresses, including high, uh, high light, for example. So that was kind of, uh, it took me some time to read carefully about uh, through the website and to their guidelines, uh, what type of research they would like to fund. But in the end, it was possible to make this link and to get some funding uh, from 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 uh, from this point of view. Another strategy I have developed also, I got some private funding from the Von Tobel Foundation. It's also a small uh, foundation in, in, in Switzerland. Um, uh, the, the, the head, it's actually a bank in, in Switzerland, a bank in Switzerland that is kind of important, but very nationally, I would say. Um, the, the head of this bank was a former student in the university and was very much interested to support uh, research in the field that he lacked when he was a uh, younger student uh, and he liked very much biotechnology and agriculture and then of course by uh, formulating a proposal that took into consideration those earlier interests of the of the head of the foundation it was also uh, possible i would say as a that in general foundations i mean if i would have to give advice to young uh, scientists applying for funding um i consider that it's still a better option to go for public funding because you at least you can trust uh, the 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 system i mean it's a it's a panel you know it's a, it has been a, it is a more transparent uh, process usually when you go for private funding it's very much through connection i mean i just gave you examples where it was Obviously, I had no direct connection, but um, I could find my ways by by clearly looking carefully at what this foundation is interested in and and trying to find some tricks in order to fit my project into their interest. Uh, but in general, I can I can speak for other experience I've made also with larger foundation like the Bill Gates. Uh, I think it's very much true uh, private uh, connection. Uh, through people that are in responsible for different programs, and this makes the process usually more risky or at least less secure than if you apply for conventional public funding where I think you stand a better chance. So uh, I think if you have a strategy to build a team, uh, which I've made quite successfully back in Switzerland and now in Belgium, um, I would not focus only on private funding. I would definitely try to find a balance between public and private. Uh, because there are different ways of, um, well, it's a different risk, it's a different probability, I would say, uh, in, in, in getting funding from those uh, different uh, those different tracks. Um, so that, that would be more or less the advice as a, I mean, I think if you go through the, the, the internet, you often find some advertisement on, on foundations where they announce some interest. Uh, I think it makes sense also to contact those foundations before uh, submitting a project so that you can get some kind of a feeling whether this is something really of interest 
uh, or not. For example, I recently connect, contacted a foundation in, based in France uh, working on starch and uh, one of the big company, Rocket Foundation, um, to, to realize that actually, while they are not so interested in working with developing countries, for example, that while well, they have different type of interest. Uh, so basically the project I, I could think of was definitely not fitting in what I could guess this directly from a phone call with them. I could directly see that what I had in mind was not at all fitting with what they, they were expecting. So I was saving time, even though through the calls and what I could see on the website, I thought I would have a good idea for uh, for this foundation. But through the phone call, I had uh, 20 minutes. It was enough time for me to find out that uh, that was that would be a waste of time. Uh, submitting this project ID. So of course now I can reformulate or rethink based on the discussion I had with them. So I would also uh, advise people to uh, to get directly in contact with those people because I think they usually have uh, communication officers that can really liaise with, with researchers and are definitely interested to provide feedback on any kind of ID you can have uh, to submit to those foundations. Um, I don't know if I spoke enough or if I should keep okay. talking. No, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. I think you've given us um, a great introduction to your experience with private funding, um, some of the differences that you have found. So, no, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, and so if anyone in any of the attendees of the webinar have any specific questions, please add them to the question box or tweet them and we'll do a general round of Q&A after all of the speakers. Um, Again, what I just can say is that I have a special uh, field of, I mean, crop biotechnology in Europe is very difficult. So while well, there are other tricks you need to, to use, I can discuss later with the questions uh, that you need to use, of course, when you're in a topic that is a bit difficult or where the public perception is difficult, because of course, foundations, they do care about the image uh, they have. So of course, uh, they don't want to be caught sometimes in, you know, supporting things that is not, not so well perceived by the public so again but there are ways to to go around this in my opinion great thank you so our next speaker is mary rose franco dr franco is the executive director of the health research alliance which is a multinational consortium of nonprofit organizations working to maximize the impact of investment in biomedical research to improve human health Dr. Franco's background includes over 20 years of program management at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, including strategic planning, as well as creating, implementing, and managing numerous programs and initiatives. These include graduate, medical student, and postdoctoral research fellowships, and an innovative and groundbreaking joint initiative with the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering at the National Institute of Health. Thank you for joining us, Mary Rose. Thank you, and, and thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate giving uh, a different perspective on uh, nonprofit funding. So as Brian mentioned, I was with HHMI for 20 years, running all their graduate and postgraduate programs before I came to the HRA. Um, so I'm pr pretty familiar with the nonprofit world. And so can I have, um, I have my slides on there. Before I go any further, I wanna tell you what the HRA is or actually show you what the HRA is. This is a graphic of our current membership. We're almost 80 uh, nonprofit, non-governmental funders of life science research. As you can see, some of these organizations are small, some are large, some are disease focused, some are not, and some uh, like heavily uh, focused a little bit more on the physical sciences. Um, some fund basic, some fund, fund translational, clinical, uh, it's, it's very much about the mission of the organization. Most of these are in the US, but not all. And um, many of them fund internationally as well. Uh, the, together we have funded over 50,000 projects and half of those projects were for career development or early career investigator awards. It's a major part of our portfolio and what a lot of us care about, certainly the pipeline issues. Um, so the background I just gave you is, is just to know, to let you know that we are a really good, fantastic source of funding for scientists in the early stages of their career, as, as well as for more senior investigators. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on why you should apply to our awards, though I, I think we're a fantastic uh, source of funding, but our members do uh, pr uh, pride themselves on providing more than just a check to our awardees. 
We often convene awardees meetings. Um, we have multitude of career development opportunities that we provide. Certainly when I was at HHMI, that was a big focus of my job is the professional development of our awardees. And I'm not sure all governments uh, care that much about the professional development. So I just wanted to stick that in there. We often invite our awardees to be part of our review process. We will work, a lot of us have our own communications department and help you publicize your findings. Our funding is often very flexible, including things like no cost extensions or stop the clock mechanisms. So these are all sorts of things that nonprofit, non-governmental funders um, can provide and, and um, that really help researchers, especially early career researchers, to be more competitive. So the ne my next slide um, is actually going, going to focus on uh, helping you provide inf providing information to help you capitalize on these opportunities from um, these 80 but but really all nonprofit non-governmental funders my take-home message is to be responsive you need to give the funder what they want and what they ask for in their program announcement um, and both when you're applying, when and if you're successful in the during the award and even after the award, it's really not that hard. But you have to read and comply with all of the documentation that your funder is going to apply. Uh, so, for instance, in the application stage, uh, make sure you read the program announcement very carefully. Target your application to the goals of the program. As Harry said, that's not um, always obvious. So I really want to reiterate what he said, call. When in doubt, call. Um, it's, or or shoot, shoot your program officer an email. It's very valuable to read the mission statement of the organization to make sure your proposal advances that mission. Um, sometimes they're very tight. They want very specific uh, direct link to their mission. Sometimes with a lot of the cancer organizations, it's much broader what they will accept in, in an application. But also take note of the funding mechanisms. There's a new, it's not that new anymore, venture philanthropy. And these organizations are very milestone driven, which means that often your subsequent funding is uh, predicated on your reaching the milestones that you put in your proposal. So make sure that you know what type of mechanism you're applying for. Um, so again, if you're unsure, it's much better to call or email your program officer than waste their time and yours uh, submitting an unresponsive application. So again, that, that's reiterating here, but 20 minutes can save you and them a lot of time. It's also very important to understand uh, their eligibility criteria and what type of applicant they are looking for, especially with career stage. So this is important. They might ask for years in a postdoc or years since a postdoc, um, uh, though often funders will make exceptions to those rules for certain situations. Again, call if you have questions. But for instance, if the um, application or the eligibility requirements say tenure track or equivalent, and you're in one of those places that doesn't have tenure track, it's really important that you make clear um, on your application that you are in an equivalent position, that your position is equivalent. And that might mean speaking to space allocation or a departmental mentoring plan. Again, if the application requires your, you to show your independence, the, you know there are ways to do that. Um, but the goal is to make it obvious to the reviewers and to the funder that the institution is committed to your success and they are providing resources to ensure that success. Again, if you have questions, call the program officer. I shouldn't even need to mention follow the rules, but you wouldn't believe how many applications are administratively triaged because people don't follow the rules. So follow the page limits, submit all the documentation you're asked for, and my recommendation is to do this at least two or three days before the deadline. So the next bullet, if, if you're successful and you get an award, yay, um, but your need to be responsive uh, to your funding organization does not end. And in fact, it's even more important once you become an awardee. Um, if you play it right, your funder is instrumental in the progression of your scientific career. 
Many have renewal mechanisms, follow on funding for the next career stage. They can often recommend you to other funders um, for awardees in their grant programs. So, or, or even include you in their advisory boards or review process. So I can't stress enough, it's very important to keep your funder happy. To do that, it means letting, you, letting them know what you're doing with their support. Certainly use their annual progress reports or periodic progress reports um, to let them know what, what you're up to. But it's even more important to do this in real time. Let them know when you've submitted a paper or posted a data set or given a talk. And always remember to credit the funding. Credit your funder anytime you uh, talk about or write about your work. Remember that these organizations have boards and donors and patients, often patients, to whom they have to account. They need to show the impact of their funding. They want to brag about you as their awardee just as much as you want to brag about being their awardee. Um, so make sure you let them know about your research outputs, publications, that's uh, whatever. It's also important, uh, um, a, a quick note, to comply with their request um, or requirement that you uh, publish in, say, open access journals or share your data sets. So again, read all the documentation that, that they send you to keep them happy and uh, comply with their rules. Um, another point, keep your institution and your funder connected, especially with respect to IP. Um, and one of the most important points I want to make is that once you are an awardee of a nonprofit funder, you are part of their family. So if they ask you a favor, maybe it's to give a talk at one of their uh, meetings for the early career investigators, or explaining your research to a donor to, to get interest in more funding, um, or, or you know whatever it is, serving on the review panel, do it if you can. If you stay connected with your funder, even long after your award term ends, it helps then it, and it helps you. And my last slide shows how you can take advantage of the Health Research Alliance webpage. Um, can we switch to the last slide? So there you go. Um, once you get on the HRA webpage, healthra.org, see there's a, and if you click it one more time, there's a members tab at the top. Um, that members tab will give you an alphabetical link to all the member profiles, and those profiles will help you quickly identify the funders that match your research interests. And I would suggest for those, you sign up for their newsletters or follow them on social media. Okay, great. So our final speaker is Candy Hassel. She's the head of researcher affairs at the Wellcome Trust, providing expert support to prospective applicants, Welcome Trust funded researchers, and importantly, the members of their team. She is also working with others to develop a program of activities to enhance welcome support for the people they fund. She held a British Heart Foundation basic science lectureship at University College London before joining Welcome in 1996. So thank you, Candy. Sorry that your thank webcam you. is backwards. <laughs> well, you've missed out seeing my Halloween uh, makeup that I'm wearing today because we're evening here now. So thank you for inviting me to join you. Um, so if I could see, uh, you can see that's me. I've got a great job title at Welcome. But today, instead of talking about my job, I'll talk about some um, things uh, more specific to what you're interested in today. So if I could have the next slide. So I'll begin with just talking about the shared characteristics of private foundations, which um, builds on what Mary Rose has already spoken about. I'll use Welcome Trust as an example and then make some final, very general points to consider. Um, because there's one message I'd like you to take home today, really, is that if you know one private foundation, you know one private foundation. <laughs> There are, of course, some shared characteristics of the organization that are private foundations, otherwise they wouldn't be classified as such. But they really are all rather different to each other. They're different in their focus, and by that I mean both their remit and also their geographical base. Um, they're different in their operations, they're different in their size. And furthermore, their operations may reflect whether or not their founders are living or dead. That, um, that makes things even more complicated. 
And another difference is that while some private foundations are created with the intention of spending out within a fixed period of time, most are established with the intention of existing in perpetuity. And all of these factors influence the way that foundations operate. This diversity, uh, which you could see from Mary Rose's Mary slides, um, the diversity is compounded by the fact that there are an awful lot of foundations. For example, in the UK, the Association of Charitable Foundations has over 350 members alone. Therefore, uh, a, a second important take home point, I think, is that we need to be careful not to make assumptions or overgeneralize about some of these things we're talking about today. So um, I'll move on to talk about one specific example of a particularly unusual research funding foundation that I am most familiar with. So if we could have slide three, please. Um, and that's the Wellcome Trust, which um, I, this is the little advert. I'm sitting in uh, one of these rooms that you can just see there. Uh, so Wellcome is an example of one of the relatively small number of foundations that account for a very large proportion of the income, assets and expenditure of foundations globally. In Europe, the top 10% of foundations account for 90% of the expenditure, and the top 1% of that 10% accounts for 50% of research innovation expenditure in, U in, in, in UK arising from Europe. And Welcome is in that top 1%. So you can see from this slide here, um, we're relatively young, maybe, 1936. Our endowment, however, is over 23 billion pounds, and we're aiming to spend up to 5 billion pounds on charitable activities over the next five years. That's a lot of cash, which is equivalent to a lot of the government funders in many countries. If we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, and we're in it in the long haul. We're in it for perpetuity because we want to improve health and we recognize that understanding all these different things from basic science through to the humanities and social sciences, translation, engaging with the public and with, um, with policy makers takes a lot of investment sustained over a long time to make major differences. If I can have next, the next slide. Our grant funding uh, portfolio currently looks like this. A lot of the funding is directed at people. This includes lots of funding to early career researchers through studentships and fellowships, teams of people who are working together, places uh, like our institutes and our centers, seed funding, resources, and miscellaneous other things. And it's spread across this large remit I've told you about. The, it's actually relatively well, rel relatively evenly spread, and these large sectors here reflect funding in, for example, the Sanger Institute here. And although the sums of money spent in the humanities and social sciences is smaller, this actually accounts for a large number of grants. Next slide, please. Oops, that's, <laughs> never mind. So um, while we are, that a lot of money is invested across the world, but undoubtedly the UK is our focus with over 3.1 billion pounds currently invested in research in the UK. Yeah. And finally, um, to talk about welcome as a specific example, the next slide, please. These are the various vehicles that we use to enable people to apply for research and to provide grants that will both support them at the appropriate stage of the career and through uh, the appropriate types of support, such as fellowships, seed grants, collaborative awards, resource awards, equipment awards, and there's a similar sorts of um, of types of funding vehicles available to humanities and social science researchers as well. I am not, you'll be reassured here, going to go into minute detail about each of these schemes. Instead, 
I want to mention some very general points. Um, I focused on welcome because it's unusual and to sort of disagree a little with Hervey, I would like to say that, that fun, the large funding agencies are very similar to the public agencies whereby our processes and our systems are very rigorous and very carefully managed to ensure transparency across the piece. Um, I would agree with what everyone has said so far. This large array of different opportunities means you have to be very careful about your to choose the right one for you. Um, and so do contact us to talk about what you've got in mind before making an application. Don't make assumptions about any funder. Check the facts. Um, not all funders look like this. Um, and I think the thing, the thing to consider is that for the focus funder, it's very, very important that you consider how you frame your proposal to help it meet the funder's objectives. As Mary Rose highlighted, they're in the business of uh, meeting their mission and they will want to ensure that every investment they make will help move towards meeting that mission. But of course, how you frame your proposal is a balancing act because you shouldn't try to artificially squeeze it into a box that doesn't really fit because that'll be obvious to anyone who reads your proposal and it will reduce the chances of it being supported. In, instead, what I really strongly advise you to do is go away and do some research to find other sources of support that more better suit your research and your career stage. And organizations like Mary Rose are a great starting point for you to, to find, find institutions where the fit is good. You need to be selective to get the best home for your application and you need to adapt your proposal accordingly and carefully and realistically and honestly to stand the best chance of success. So good luck. <laughs> There's plenty of choice out there, which is great, but it can be challenging. OK, thank you, Brianne. Thank you, Candy. Um... So I, I think my, the biggest take home that I've come from all three of you speaking is that it seems even more important when working with private funders or looking for private funders that we're in communication with, with the organization. So more so than maybe with the government funding, when you're looking for private funding, make sure you start the, the communication early to make sure that you're meeting their, the aims of the organization and really know what they're looking for. Um, and make sure that your application is targeted to the right place. So thank you. We now invite the audience to ask questions to the panelists. You can type a question in the question box here or tweet us um, on Twitter, so at eLife Community and using the hashtag ECR Wednesday. If your, your question is for a particular speaker, please, please let us know um, by identifying that in the question. Um, so I've looked through some of the questions that have been um, submitted and overwhelmingly everyone wants to know when it comes to these private sources of funding, where do international applicants fit in? Can international applicants apply for these uh, private sources? And in particular, researchers in developing countries. Um, so just, uh, maybe Mary Rose, did you want to start with that? Sure, I'll start. Um, so it, it, again, great question, um, differs by organization. So of course, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, spend a lot of money in the developing world. Anybody who funds uh, malaria spends a lot of money in the developing world, and um, it, including the um, scientists in the, and Howard Hughes itself had a whole program in, in South Africa, in, in, in Kaira. It's um, the, the goal is to solve the problem, is to put whatever resources, your mission and, and your personal, your resources of your organization will work to solve the problem. So that's one of the beauties of nonprofit funding. We're not in the US, you know, US tax dollars go towards US citizens. Nonprofit funders spend their resources to fund the best science, the, the science that has the greatest potential to 
address the problem, be that um, team sciences across the globe, be that uh, a science who's embedded in a developing country or one that's collaborating with somebody in the US. So you'll, again, you have to read the program announcement very carefully, or it might not even be obvious. So at that point, if you want to spin something, if you want to suggest something, hey, I, you know, I want this team from here to here to, to tackle Ebola, and there is, um, you know, a, a, a funder that has that as their mission, go for it. Send an email and start the contact. So yes, we're very open. Unlike the federal, U.S. federal government, nonprofit, non-governmental funders are very open to all, all across the globe. Great. And and Candy, could you speak for your, from your experience? Yes. Welcome, uh, just to echo Mary Rose. Um, different funding schemes, different funders have different eligibility requirements. But yes, just because uh, an organization is based in a particular geographical location, just because its head office is in London or in in, in uh, Seattle, doesn't mean to say the funding only goes to that country. And specific calls are always in place to fund people to carry out research where the, the, the object of the research is most relevant. So, you know, Wellcome spends a lot of money um, directly in low and middle income countries, funding scientists who are in those countries to uh, do research on the health and the disease uh, challenges locally. So, um, and indeed, a lot of other funders um, in this uh, health charity remit do as well. So there's there's lots of different sources out there. So as as we've said before, do your research, be selective, and contact to talk about the details. Great, thank you. So our um, the next question I'm going to start with Hervé. It's about uh, flexibility of the funding. And so one thing that you were talking about, it sounded from your experience that sometimes these private sources of funding are more flexible. Now, we've also heard that even these private sources do have important stakeholders and specific aims, and that's why it's important to be in communication with them when you're preparing your application. But do you want to offer um, or say more about your experience and the flexibility of these private funders? Well, from again, I can only speak from my own experience, which is only with a few uh, private funders. Um, so far, I have only experienced quite flexible uh, scheme, I would say, also in terms of, um, uh, I don't know, for, for, you know, when you are leading a group, sometimes like this no cost extension is very important because you haven't spent all the resources in the first years. And I found so far, um, being the foundations I mentioned, but also some others where I got money from, um, I found them relatively flexible, probably more flexible than public. Uh, but again, I can only speak of the about the, the ones I have experienced so far. So um, I'm not sure that this applies for, for every foundation, even though recently we had also some from the gates and this was also very, very flexible as well. So I don't, I think my experience is, tells me that it's relatively flexible, at least more flexible than public funding. Um, so that's that's my experience. I cannot say more than this. Mary Rose, did you want to say anything about the flexibility of the nonprofit that you work with? Yeah. yeah. So I, I would say we're we try to be more flexible, and and we have the we're nimble, so we can. Um, for instance, data sharing is um, a huge thing now, um, but it came up so quickly. Who who funds data sharing? That's a a, a big expense to the scientists. Um, sometimes, so uh, nonprofit funders will try to find a pot of money that's outside the grant to make it happen. So if you call your funder and you say, you know, I, I have a huge expense, um, it, but I, you want me to share my data, but I, you know, it needs a lot of scrubbing. It needs, so we will try to find what we can or allow you to shift things from pot A to pot B again, no cost extension is huge. Things that we pay for, um, more flexible childcare. Um, some, some companies or some organizations pay for childcare when you go to meetings and, and all kinds of family friendly policies um, nonprofit funders can do. We're not setting a huge precedent. Um, we're doing what, um, what we need to do to advance our mission completely different from a nonprofit or from a governmental funder. 
Candy, did you want to say something about the flexibility of funding? Yeah, I, th I think it, the fundamental thing that is when it's when what you're asking makes it more likely that your research, the investment that the funder has made in you and your research will come to the maximum possible optimal outcome, then we are, as Mary Rose said, able to be nimble, flexible and say, oh, go, yeah, go ahead. Um, some some of the private foundations are, are very small, however, and it and and sometimes actually there is a trade-off there in relation to getting a grant that from a small foundation that may not be rich enough to enable you to um, perhaps have quite as much flexibility that the big funders can 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 allow you to have, um, and so. It, it goes back to the, the variation between funders, but, but if you don't ask us, then we can't say yes. And, and very often in, in a long, working at Welcome for such a long time, too often uh, grant holders are shy about asking for, uh, for more flexibility or asking about advice about what they can do and what they can't do. And, um, you know, if you don't ask, you're not going to get a yes for sure. And if you do ask, the answer may be no, but it's a good chance it's going to be yes if you've got a good case. And as I said, that it means that your research will will be more successful at the end. That's great. I do think that's a, a large benefit of these private funders is they increase mm -hmm. flexibility. Um, OK, so now I want to ask a question about risk. Now, we've talked mostly about nonprofit funders, but I know in the case of um, some life science researchers where they're private funders for for-profit companies and you do hear of pharma companies investing in research and then silencing or limiting what the researchers can then share um, or publish and of course for early career researchers who focus on a particular mouse model or drug and then aren't able to publish it can be a real problem so um, would anyone like to speak about the risks with working with um, certain private funders? Candy, do you want to? Um, you want well, to I've, 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 I've just drawn a deep breath. Um, again, welcome is atypical. Um, one of the things, one of the, our philosophies, one of the great driving central pillars of our outlook is that uh, just as with publicly funded research, the actual fruits of privately funded research should be shared in order to maximize the outputs of that research. That's the welcome perspective in relation to being a large foundation with a very broad remit, um, whereby the, the income that we use to spend to fund research is generated from an endowment rather than from, for example, any profit that is generated by the research itself. So it's very difficult to generalize, but I think it is a very good question in relation to illustrating the point that you really should do your research about what you're getting into early rather than um, being very linear in how you make assessments about which which funder to apply to, which type of grant to apply to, and, and, uh, and just accepting what goes along with it. If you think that, for example, your, the outcomes of your research may have um, IP, then again, that most grant funding agencies will ask you about that in the application form, and you can always discuss it with the officers of that funding agency before you even um, submit your grant. And so let me bring in another perspective here as well. So obviously the disease focused organizations want drugs to go to market. They want publish, they want impact. And that means publishing. That means mm -hmm. other people knowing what you've done and being able to take that and, and carry it further to, to other studies and, and other cohorts, things like that. So we want that to happen, um, but we also want to have pharma interested in it and you know that they, they want to be able to make money so this is one of the benefits i think of partnering with your your funder is your partner 
So in this instance, especially in cases if it's a rare disease, the fund you you have something that you want to license, your funder knows knows the companies and can help you license that. And plus, your funder is going to watch your back at the beginning. Your funder is going to give you the IP words that you that and working with your institution. Um, they have rules, um, but and most of those rules are you have to be able to share. Um, and yet they will help you work with the pharma. So if I were an early career researcher, I would be very excited actually to have someone watching my back, not just my institution, but my funder to say, you want, we want you to publish. We want you to get this out. We want you to get this drug to the clinic. And yes, um, it's going to take pharma, but it's going to take pharma working with us to make this um, globally impactful, not just make money for the pharmaceutical companies. Right. Hervé, do you have any experience or, or can you think of any of the specific risks from private donations which might limit? Sharing? Well, in some cases, of course, they would, they would uh, put some conditions on what they are funding or they want to have some kind of private agreement on, on the results that are, well, some confidentiality, I should say. Uh, but that's something you should always involve your also your legal office about, right? Because I mean, at the university, you can always discuss and uh, the agreement you have to sign for those foundations. So, I think that's something that needs to be um, that needs to be um, looked into, of course. And you have to define whether this is something that is still of interest for you uh, to engage in such a research that is founded by someone who wants to keep some kind of confidentiality. I have to say that in my case, it's, I mean, in, in, in plant, it's probably different from the pharma uh, industry. We we have less restricted or we are less exposed to this kind of, of restriction, I would say. Okay, great. So our next question is about the reviewing process for private funders. Uh, so is there any difference between how projects are reviewed for the government funded versus these private sources? Do they include external experts? Um, and during that process, are there steps in place to keep it confidential? Um, Mary Rose, do you want to? Sure, I, I can start. So uh, when HRA first started in 2006, our eligibility to be an HRA member said you have to have robust peer review. And in our mind, we were thinking of NIH peer review, just the, the typical external uh, but we have learned about so many organizations that do s robust scientific review without your traditional external peer review. Um, the, it's still an eligibility that you have to have a scientific review. You can't pick your buddies. You can't award money to your doctor. Um, it, you, the, the goal here is robust scientific review. However, uh, many organizations bring in lay reviewers to make sure, uh, or or patients, to make sure that um, this proposal fits with the mission and and uh, patient oriented. And look at things like um, the end goal. So if if, if the um, vaccine or or the the treatment that someone is the diagnosis is a spinal tap. You have patients on the review board to say, no, that's not something that we're willing to, to go for. Um, so this part of the review, even though scientifically it, it hits the mission, um, you know, that's not something that's that's kosher with the patients. So to have patients or other people to, to judge the mission of the proposal, even though the scientific the science may be fabulous. Um, Another thing is training environment. So that's something that we look at very carefully depending on the mechanism. So there's people on the board that can look at a mentoring plan or for the departmental mentoring plan, for instance. If that's important to the mechanism, you have specific people on the review panel that look at that. We also have biostatisticians that look at, are things powered correctly? Is it gonna be from, a, take it from a mouse model into humans? You have the statistical power there. So your review process is very different depending on the mechanism, the proposal, the organization, but it's all robust and scientifically um, uh, accurate. Um, and yes, we all make sure that the confidential, confidentiality is maintained. 
Just to, very just to add, add, this is Candy again, just to add to that, I, I agree with everything that Mary Rose said, it's, it's, it's very robust, but, but I would say it might be scaled through different sized organisation. The Wellcome Trust, for example, spends a lot of money on the peer review process itself. We fly in people from around the world to, to, to interview applicants for us. We use a lot of international referees. Clearly, for some of the smaller foundations, they are not going to spend as much money proportionately on the peer review if they don't spend that much money on the research itself. So it may be um, um, sort of scaled down a bit, but I think the principles that Mary Rose highlighted are absolutely um, spot on and especially the use of, of patients and uh, community members uh, to, to input in these important decisions on how, for example, the money that they may have created or raised by riding bicycles for hundreds of miles is being invested to, to help uh, family members with, with their health problems. So very, very rigorous, um, very um, professional. Great, so we just have a few minutes left and we'll have time for one final question. Um, if any of the attendees have any unanswered questions, please continue to tweet to our Twitter account, which is at eLife Community, and using the hashtag ECR Wednesday. Um, so for the final question that we have, um, one of the attendees has asked, what to do in a situation if the institution fails to meet the agreed terms between itself and the foundation and the researcher. Um, and perhaps this is more of a problem when dealing with it, smaller funders or funders that institutions aren't typically dealing with. Um, would anyone like to address that question? I would, this is Candy, I would, I would just emphasize the point that Mary Rose said. It's very, very important to build a working relationship with, with your funder. Um, and as an early career researcher, you're obviously, you know, sometimes you haven't got a strong relationship within your institution with the research office, for example. I think transparency and openness is key. And um, the last thing that any funder wants to do, be it a, a public funder or as a private funder, is to waste its investment in someone because something has gone wrong. So if necessary, we will talk to the institution directly on, on the behalf of grant holders. Um, but, but the key is, is to tell people about these um, problems rather than sort of struggle on through in the hope that they'll resolve themselves. I think that's great advice. So now I will invite uh, each of our panelists um, to say some final um, concluding remarks. Um, Herve, you want to start? Yeah, maybe something that has not been mentioned and that's uh, just I wanted to add to close this. Um, uh, I think it's also very important to look at the projects that have been granted. You can learn a lot from looking at the list of projects that have been granted in the previous years. Uh, of course, we describe a very ideal situation where the review process is is very transparent and peer review and so on. It's not always the case. You you might have there might be some bias sometimes in some foundation uh, towards uh, big institution, uh, famous institution, whatever. And all those kind of things you can really learn from looking at all the projects that have been uh, granted. You can really learn about the strategy people have used to to get their project funded. Uh, it can be a very sexy research or you know the, the way it's presented. Usually reading their abstract. You can guess a bit the type of uh, if it's more innovative, if it's more high risk, low risk, and so on. Uh, if there is a bias towards um, certain um, institution, all this kind of information you can usually grab by carefully looking at all the projects that have been granted. So I would definitely recommend uh, before you start uh, applying to, to a program or into this private funding, I would also spend a few minutes looking through what has been funded in the previous years because I think you can really you can also design your strategy in terms of project uh, design and of course selection it was mentioned that there are many many uh, foundations i mean you 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 have to to make a short list or a selection right uh, so maybe from from looking at the project that have been funded you get a better idea uh, also the, the the type of funding i mean if it's a smaller scale a small grants big grants and so on it might i, I really think it, it makes sense to spend a bit of time and usually those foundations are very open right i mean they put this online you can really 
see all the projects that have been funded. So it's, it's very easy to access this information. So that would be my final uh, advice for the, the attendees of, of this uh, webinar, uh, okay. to spend some time, definitely spend some time before writing up uh, a proposal. That, that makes sense to, to have a good strategy. Great. Mary Rose, do you have any final comment? Sure. My final comment is that, and, um, is that we cannot compete with the federal government. The government, look at the numbers. So our niche is often funding that risky science. So I have been in so many review panels where the reviewer were like, you know what, this might fail. And we define failure completely differently. It's just, um, it, you know, it doesn't support the hypothesis, but if this works, it will be awesome. So I would think that you're much more likely if you have a wild and crazy idea to be successful applying to a nonprofit, non-governmental fund. Great. And Candy, a, a final comment? Yes, I do. Something I meant to say, so thanks for this. Um, I'd like to say that big is not always better. Um, I talked about welcome because that's where I work. Um, and we have large amounts of cash available for research, but it's invested across a very broad range of schemes and science and countries. Sometimes smaller foundations with a narrow remit, they may be there may be less funding available, but if you're working on something that falls well within that more narrow focus, your chances of success may well be higher because you're just competing with other people who work in the small field rather than competing across the enormous breadth of biomedicine and public health. So don't ignore the smaller foundations. Great. Well, thank you so much to our speakers and to everyone who tuned in today and contributed to the discussion. It was a wonderful opportunity to learn more about private funding for research in the life sciences. Our next ECR Wednesday webinar will be held on the 28th of November, and the topic will be art in science communication. Uh, so tune into Twitter, and please have a great day and happy Halloween. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye. Bye-bye.